Hello, everybody. I'm here with uh, my friends Nick Colas and Jessica Rabe. They are the co-founders of DataTrek, one of the most respected research firms on Wall Street. And today we're trying something new. We're calling it What Did We Learn? We're going to be checking in with Jessica and Nick on a regular basis and see what we can learn about what's happening with stocks, bonds, the economy, the markets, all of the things that we normally talk about on this channel. Uh, Nick and Jessica, thanks so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. All right. I know you guys weren't terribly busy today because it is uh, President's Day. So I'm always surprised when I wake up in the morning and it's President's Day and the market's closed. Uh, Columbus Day, it's open. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> that, so that one I had to remind myself too. Oh, wait, it's not actually a holiday. So I get, I get confused. Uh, we're about the, I, I don't know, is it, is it safe to say we're still midpoint of Q1, maybe a few days past? Uh, I think, I feel like uh, earnings season has gone pretty well. Obviously, all of the asset classes that we follow have been doing pretty well and a lot of follow through from the rally that ended last year. Um, but I wanted to start off with some of the things that we've learned uh, since we've gotten halfway through Q1. And the first thing is interest rates have risen uh, since the end of 2023. What do you guys see going on here, uh, specifically in shorter term in shorter term yields? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about what we've learned so far in 2024, it's that uh, large cap stocks can work even if yields go up. That's sort of been the, the the central talking point of the first half of the first quarter. And like you said, yields have gone up. You know, twos are up 39 basis points, tens are up 42 basis points. Kind of a big move, you know, uh, resetting a little bit from last year. Um, Fed funds futures are expecting three or four cuts this year instead of six or five, which they were expecting at the beginning of the year. So you've had the entire yield curve kind of reset modestly higher in terms of yield, and yet stocks have worked out okay. Corporate bond markets still pretty strong. You know, uh, the investment grade spreads are less than 100 basis points, which is only happens when the economy is good, when we've never had a recession 12 months after uh, IG spreads are this low. So another positive point. All kind of says, you know, the economy's okay, yields reset a little bit higher, large cap stocks have worked their way up, small caps are kind of flat. And it says we got a lot of confidence in the U.S. economy. Things are going pretty well, and it's going better than the rest of the world, frankly. And the dollar is stronger versus every major currency developed and emerging except for the Indian rupee. Um, U.S. large caps are outperforming IFA and EM. It's a very kind of narrow move higher for global equities. It's U.S. large caps and pretty much everything else is a little bit, you know, worse off. So it's basically the bottom line is, hey, we've had a good first half of the first quarter. The economy is OK. Corporate earnings are OK. And we're off to the races. Do you guys feel like the story at the end of 2023, the narrative that uh, everyone involved in the market told themselves was 2024 is going to be the year that we get all these rate cuts? Those cuts have come off the table. Stocks have levitated regardless. And we have a new story, which is stocks don't mind higher rates. Yeah, it's, that's a very good summary of what we've had so far in the year. Okay. I'd say the wrinkle is going to be the 10-year going over 425. And kind of if it flirts back with 450, then we're going to test that thesis pretty hard. Because if you go back the last two to three years, S&P 10-year yields, they're kind of lockstep. You know, one, one breaks through 425, the other one goes down. You know, rates stabilize, stocks go up. So I kind of think we're going to have another version of that again this year. Uh, you guys were saying the combination of higher rates, stronger dollar, U.S. Out, uh, equity outperformance is consistent with a mid-cycle playbook or your mid-cycle playbook. Talk a little bit about uh, this mid-cycle situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, how long can these periods persist? What should be what should we be watching for um, so that the mid-cycle doesn't turn into late cycle before yes. uh, before we've made any kind of a mental adjustments? Yes. So. Yeah, mid-cycle basically is everything that's not early cycle, which is recession and you know the economy falling out of bed and stocks going down. And late cycle, which is occasionally that period where you know things are going to get ugly, but they haven't quite gotten ugly yet. Everything else is mid-cycle, and those periods can go on for years and years. So 1995 to 99, 03 to 07, 2012, call it to 2019, they go on for years. And during those periods, a couple of things usually happen. The first is large caps outperform small caps. And okay, large caps, <laughs> U.S. large caps outperform rest of world. 
check. Right. Rates rates kind of bang around wherever they're going to be, and occasionally you're going to worry about a recession. And check, we're getting some of that. The dollar tends to be strong, so we're getting that. We're like literally checking every single box in the mid cycle playbook, and that's the period that we're in. And like you know, we alluded to, it can go on for a long, long time. So despite all the stuff that's different about uh, the post pandemic recovery, you're saying. Um, the, the big things tend to align pretty well with what we normally say in a, in a mid cycle. Yeah. And you know, if you look at sectors that work, you know, mid cycle sectors that work tech, healthcare, and financials, okay. exactly the three outperforming sectors this year. So we're literally hitting every part of the playbook extremely hard. Uh, Jessica, how much do you worry about things being too good or too easy for investors? Because this is a big thing that's on my mind right now. Uh, like what, like when do we cross over from saying, Hey, the market's pretty good to don't worry. The market's bulletproof. And I don't think we're there sentiment wise. Um, but like, that's, that seems to me to be the thing that maybe we should be watching for. Yeah. One of the biggest things we hear that people are worried about is our tech stocks overvalued, but a couple of the simple metrics that we look at, uh, one is just simply the, the two year rolling returns in the NASDAQ composite. So the average two-year NASDAQ uh, return back over the last 50 years is 26%. Over the last two years, it's only up 14%. So as much as the NASDAQ rallied last year and is continuing that rally this year, it's really just trying to play some catch-up and getting back to the longer run mean. And another another thing we look at is uh, just the the year-over-year return in the NASDAQ. So we look so what we look at for here is a double is a bubble. So whenever the Nasdaq doubles in a year, it's usually a reliable p- predictor of a bubble. So go back to say uh, February 2000, the Nasdaq doubled in a year, right around the the peak for the dot com bubble, or even in the last speculative tech bubble, the Nasdaq was up 80 percent year over year in uh, March 2021. So between 80 percent to a double we get concerned right now the nasdaq's only up 34 percent year over year an impressive gain but nowhere near certifiable bubble status so you wouldn't measure you wouldn't measure that off any specific low you would just like say a year sounds like the right cadence where if things double it's probably way too much we do but even if you want to measure it uh, the NASDAQ versus its low at the end of 2022, it's still only up 54%, nowhere right. near the, the right. 80 to 100%. I'm not saying we can't get there. That can certainly happen. We're just not there yet. So if it doubles, it's a bubble. You know how I know that's probably true? Doubles it, a bubble. Because it, it rhymes. And I only <laughs> I only follow inv- investment maxims that rhyme, like sell in May. Like these are, these are the ones that I believe most in. Uh all right, I want to I want to ask you about stock bond correlations, and this is another thing that's really on the minds of everyone working in wealth management. And there's two consequences here of whether or not this is going to continue from from where I sit. I talk to RIAs, financial advisors, and you know many of them have built these portfolios for clients on the premise that when your equities get into trouble, your bonds are going to bail you out. You'll have Excess liquidity in, in bonds, no problem. You'll be able to sell, buy more stocks. And we'll do that systematically, or we'll do that on a calendar basis, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that didn't work very well in 2022. The end result of that in 23 and continuing into 24, we have this explosion in interest in alternatives. So it seems as though financial advisors don't want to have to answer the same questions they had to answer in 2022 about stock bond correlation and stock bond portfolios being quote unquote effective. Um, So that's one of the major, that's one of the major uh, consequences of, of that period, I think. And then the second one is really, you know, as people create portfolios prospectively or show them to clients, um, they're probably going to have to get a little bit more in depth on when stocks and bonds correlate and why and how long those periods can go on for. So I, I'm really glad I have the chance to, to talk to you about some of the stuff that you found looking at U.S. stocks and long-dated treasury price correlations. What's, uh, let's, let's start with your chart. What are we looking at here? 
Sure, yeah. So I'll just give a, a few brief background points. So this is definitely a, a grimy topic, very important. Certainly one of the, the key things we've learned this year is that the price correlation between stocks and long-dated treasuries can be the highest it's been at any point in the last 20 years. So as for what correlations are and why they matter, correlation is just a statistical measure of how closely uh, two variables track one another. So a correlation of negative one means they track and they move in opposite directions. A correlation of plus one, they move together. And a zero correlation, uh, they move independently of one another. Now, stocks and bonds are usually inversely correlated, so they move in opposite directions. And that's great for owners of stocks and bonds because it gives you, or it's supposed to, it traditionally has given you diversification in your portfolio. However, uh, if you bring up the, the chart you just mentioned, you can see that if you look at the price correlation between the S&P 500 and TLT, the plus 20-year bond ETF, the average 100-day correlation over the last 20 years is negative 0.3. Right now, as you can see on uh, to the right uh, of the chart, where the, the correlation between TLT and S&P 500 over the last 100 days is 0.3. That's over two standard deviations. So extre- above the extremely average. Extremely correlated, meaning on a day to day basis, for the most part, they're starting to move in lockstep with each other. Exactly. So it makes investing harder, right? Because on any given day, either it looks like everything's working or everything is not working and everything looks bad. The values, so the values of the, people's the, accounts are swinging more so than they would if one of them were offsetting the other. Yeah, as much as as stocks usually go up when they go down, bonds have tended to go up. That's not the case right now. Right, and that and so as much as stock market volatility is low, if you own stocks and bonds in a portfolio, you're probably seeing higher than normal bond volatility. I mean, b- uh, bond stock volatility in your portfolio. Right. Uh, you point out that it's no different if you were to look at the triple Qs, which is the Nasdaq yeah. instead of the S and P. I mean, obviously, this makes sense because the overlap. The largest stocks in the S&P are also the largest stocks in the NASDAQ? Yeah, actually, uh, one in, so for the NASDAQ, the the 100-day correlation between, the, if you look at the NASDAQ 100, the Qs versus TLT, right now it's, point, it's positive 0.2 versus the average over the last 20 years is usually negative 0.25. So it's still high. However, it's not as high as the S&P 500. They're a little bit less sensitive to rates. You wouldn't think so because you think tech stocks, high valuations, but a little bit less sensitive actually to long rates in the S&P because the S&P is, uh, has higher weightings to cyclicals like financials and industrials. I guess, I guess that story makes sense also because the companies that comprise the NASDAQ are the least likely to require to you know, any kind of borrowing or or credit uh, extension, uh, I think that's a big. All right, so you guys have a theory as to what's causing this or uh, why you think we're seeing it? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's certainly that the stock and bond market are trying to figure out where interest rates are going to be. It's not the it's not the twenty twenty tens anymore, where the Fed's in control of the entire yield curve. Well, the market's setting long-term rates, but not really where it's sure where they should go. Equity markets know that and know how important that is to discounting stock prices. And so correlations are high. As for when this will resolve itself, we, th- we still think we're about a year out because we really need more clarity on when inflation is going to get back down to the 2% target. Recent strong economic data shows it's unclear if, if the Fed's going to be able to achieve that anytime soon. Do you think this results in portfolio managers who are multi-asset uh, just utilizing more cash than historically they would have, and you know, staying away from duration, staying away from, and you know, any treasury bond that's more than you know a ten-year treasury, or is there maybe a trade to be made betting that this level of correlation is probably unlikely to persist for you know that much longer? Like what? Where? Which side of that yeah, would you would ex- you wait? Would you fall fall down on? Yeah, excellent, uh, excellent points and questions. So I I would say that we're this we're definitely in an anomalous period right now. Where this is not this is not 
the paradigm. So we're, we'll certainly look back and say this was a very unusual period of super high correlations relative to history. I think we're not saying to totally, you know, ditch long rates altogether, like like long long data treasuries altogether, like TLT. If you go back to as much as they didn't work in 2022, if you go back to 2020, in the event of a of a true crisis, it did work out as a really good hedge to keep people in the game, including Nick and myself. So, you know, should there be an economic shock later this year or a geopolitical shock? At the end of the day, the dollar and long dated treasuries are still safe haven assets. Uh I want to I want to talk about small caps. There's some weird stuff going on in in the Russell 2000 year to date. It sort of feels like the meme stock craze with AMC and GameStop whipping the the Russell 2000 around, which happened in early 2021. In hindsight, that should have been a sign that, you know, uh that that would be unsustainable, uh and of course it turned out to have been. This time we have different stocks but a similar phenomenon. Uh you guys took a look at super micro computer and its effect on uh here well so here's price that looks like a blow off top to me uh without making any price predictions what just on on the surface this is a stock that goes from $300 in the middle of January to $1000 2 weeks later and round trips back down part of the way to about 800 so i I don't know if the next 200 points are higher or lower, but <laughs> that's sort of that's sort of parabolic Empire State Building uh, formation historically is not the kind of thing that I'd ever want to be caught long in. Uh, but what what do you think is happening here? Yeah, you know, it's the right stock to focus on because you know the Russell's up 30 bips on the year, 30 basis points, and SMCI is the entire 30 basis points and then some. It's up oh, 180. Yeah. It's up 182 percent year to date. It's got an average weighting this year of one percent. It's almost two points of Russell performance all on its own. Okay. So that's yeah, you're right. It's a little microcosm of what we had back in in the spec bubble. And it's funny, small caps, actually, the, sort of that insight leads to like a bigger insight about the small cap space because it only works in two parts of the cycle. It works early in the cycle when a bunch of really beaten down but kind of high weighting names all of a sudden rip. They go from, say, 10 to 100 in a year. There are cyclicals, there are banks, there's things that get really beaten down at the bottom and they rip. That's why small caps are so good early in the cycle because they're like a hyper supercharged play on that recovery. The other time small caps work is when you get a spec bubble. And it's too early to say we're getting one now, but we only have a couple of names doing this. SMCI is the most egregious example. If we have 10 SMCIs because speculative phase continues this year, then you're going to see kind of a repeat of 21. You're going to see that same kind of move. That's the only two reasons to own small caps. One, at the bottom of a cycle. And two, if you want to play a spec trade, you know, but don't want to buy an individual name, small caps will work then. And SMCI, year to date, definitely like fits the, what have we learned this year? We've learned yeah. that there can be spec trades again, and we're having one. So what's interesting about SMCI is that the day it hit 1,000, that actually happened in concert with a research report from Bank of America I think initiating coverage on the stock or upgrading it. And I think their target was a thousand. So they got instant gratification on the call. Um, but there's like a real fundamental story there. It's not Reddit and like a conspiracy of, you know, younger traders who like have decided they want to fight the shorts or anything like that. There is a fundamental story behind SMCI. I'm not saying it would justify what the stock has done. But maybe that's an important distinction from 2021 uh, to now. It's, it's it not is, quite a meme I'll, stock. I'll tell you, I went out to dinner on Friday night with my wife in Midtown Manhattan at a very old school French restaurant. And I know the staff there. They know what I do. And uh, the maitre d' comes over into the theater and says, what do you think about SMCI? Yeah. So it's it, it's crossed over. It's a, it's a stock that people are talking about that are far away from Wall Street. Okay. Yep. How, so it's I think the market cap was $50 billion at the peak. So obviously at that level, it doesn't belong in the Russell 2000. The Ru Russell does, I think they do an annual reconstitution, mm -hmm. and I think it's in May. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. So this could persist for a while before they make a decision on the stock. Yes, and that is the irony of the small cap space generally, because anything that's truly excellent in the Russell 2 gets bumped to the Russell 1. 
and yeah. you got to replay replay the whole game over again. It's not like the SP 500 where you kind of hold it forever. Right. You know, the, they, the best, they, the they best stuff cycles out. They graduate, which is maybe a flaw within a small cap and mid cap indices relative to the S and P. Like the S and P can keep a stock like Apple forever. Uh, <laughs> the S and P can be fifteen percent two stocks, and no one complains. You know, it's funny. My my <laughs> my brother when he when he finished college, he went out to Hollywood and he wanted to be an agent, but he wasn't coming out of Yale, so he wasn't at William Morris. He was at one of like the second or third tier agencies, and the guy who he got the job with told him the worst thing that can happen is we succeed for our clients. So, so my brother said, well, wait, I don't understand. I'm running all over town trying to get, trying to get my clients auditions and meetings with directors and uh, commercial spots. He said, yeah, I know. And if you succeed, it's the worst thing that could happen because then they fire you and they go to CAA or William Morris. So like when you're representing second tier talent, trying to get them bumped up to the A list or even the B list, the worst thing that could happen for your own career is you actually succeed in in helping them with their career. Now, of course, it's you know kind of a joke. Uh, I don't think they really meant it, but you have a small cap like SMCI undergoes this massive secular uh, tailwind, and everyone starts to recognize it. The problem is for the Russell two thousand. It's like, oh, that was one of our superstar stocks. Now it's gone. We got to replace it with a company that makes pet food or, or whatever else goes into the index. So Yeah, the only benefit, it's an evergreen process, and there's always enough going on that something is going to work at the right part of the cycle. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask, when you said uh, the Russell ends up looking like a VC portfolio, and only a few huge winners deliver the marginal return. Is that in yeah. all market environments? Is that is that a constant, or is that uh, during bull markets? That is the one constant in capital markets, and I think the one constant we can rely on. And you know, the Best and Binder paper that we've talked about in the past, where they look at sixty-four thousand stocks from nineteen ninety to twenty twenty, and look at what makes for the total return in aggregate market value, U.S. and global, and it's basically two percent of stocks drive a hundred percent of the value creation over a long time frame. Fifty-five percent of stocks don't even make T-bill returns on any given three-year period. Only thirty percent of stocks outperform. Any way you cut it, it's really a handful of names that end up making long-term returns possible. And it's much more apparent in the U.S. The U.S. has far better long-term returns than the rest of the world because we have just a better ecosystem from everything from finding the right people, finding the right talent, getting to the right schools, giving them capital, getting to start companies, and then having the right infrastructure around them to provide long-term growth. It's why Facebook exists. It's why Apple exists. It's why everything we talk about is megatech exists and continues to grow. But yeah, it, the whole world's a VC portfolio. It's a lot of stuff that doesn't really work great and a handful of names that are just awesome. So I just buy the two percent that that drive all the returns. I don't, it's very easy. I don't know. I don't what waste the my time is. with the other. <laughs> uh, so you guys have a YouTube channel, and it's uh, Nick Colas and Jessica Rabe is the name of the channel. Um, and I watch your stuff, of course. And we're going to link to your YouTube channel in the show notes. Um, but the YouTube audience is younger than the audience that you guys typically speak to. I suppose when you're talking to hedge funds or institutional investors, it's certainly younger than the traditional wealth management uh, audience. And Jessica, you wanted to throw something in about uh, careers uh, for younger people here. So, t so take it away. Yeah, it's actually something that you've been saying, Josh, for years, that investing in tech stocks is a career hedge for millennials. And it's so true. And it's certainly one thing we learned La over the last couple of years and continue to learn that disruptive technology like Gen AI is making having a sustainable career harder than ever. For people over the age of 50, it's not as big of a deal because they're they're through a lot of their career already. But for people like myself in their 20s, it's hugely important because we're going to be dealing with this for the you know the decades to come. And so we certainly believe investing in tech stocks is important as a career hedge but also just a, a suitable long-term investment in general for anyone because any disruption that comes, those big tech stocks, they're going to figure out a way to monetize it. I think that's a really interesting point. Like, I don't think that anyone would go so far as to say own the NASDAQ instead of the S&P 500, but certainly if you're younger and you could tolerate 
uh, bigger swings and more volatility that you might get in, in the NASDAQ, it's probably a worthwhile thing to tolerate because to your point, we don't know what the career landscape is going to look like in the United States in 10 years or all over the world, but it's a pretty safe bet. There are companies that are going to figure it out and make a lot of money and they're going to be NASDAQ companies like for, for the most yeah. part. Yeah. And tech tech has been consistently the one area of the, of the stock market that's been undervalued and that out- outperforms as a result. All right. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming by. This has been a lot of fun. We're going to tell people to check out datatrekresearch.com. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about all of the amazing research that Nick and Jessica put out, you guys are five days a week. Is that is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, no excuses. Five Sunday days a week. night through Thursday night. Sunday night yes. through Thursday night. Uh, tons of research, tons of insights on all the stuff that we care so much about and uh, we focus on. Uh, and of course, ch- make sure you check out Nick and Jessica's YouTube channel. How and how frequently are you guys putting out videos there? Are we going once a week now that the New Year's kind of fun, full, full, full scope? Okay. All right. What, how, what's it like keeping that pace? You guys got it? You can handle it? Oh, yeah. Yeah? All right. All right. Well, I, lo- I love watching it's your really stuff. really good. I love watching your stuff because I read it, but then having you explain it to me, uh, I think it sinks in better. Uh, or maybe there are some elements of it that are more conversational and less specific to the data. And so I get a lot out of what you guys are doing uh, on, on the channel as well. All right, that's it from us. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Uh, Check out datatrackresearch.com. Thanks to Nick and Jessica. We will talk to you soon.